Well, hi everyone. My name is Macy Moeller. I'm the new executive director for HCTV. On behalf of us in the Hardwick Gazette, welcome to Pie and Politics, or Politics and Pie. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. We're really excited to be um, here with the candidates, and there's bathrooms out and to the right. And I'll pass it off to Jan. Okay, thank you very much, Macy. So I'm just gonna go over really quickly sort of the, the intent for this evening. We've got some guidelines that we're asking um, all the participants this evening, the candidates and, and yourselves, to sort of just keep in mind. And I call them guidelines because they're not rules. We, we're gonna break them you know, all the time uh, tonight or elsewhere, but they're good things to keep in mind. And I'm just gonna help us you know, keep each other on track. Okay, so first of all, um, we're inviting you to, uh, well, let me just back up one second. Um, there was an idea for this that we were looking for a different kind of a conversation. I've, I don't know about you, Reb, listening to some of the uh, debates on Vermont Public. And they're your typical kind of debates. Um, position points, sometimes a little jab at their opponent. We're gonna try and do something a little bit different. One, we wanna give people some more, plenty of time to talk about where they're coming from on these issues and to be a little bit more collaborative. So we wanna give people the time for for to tell us not just what their positions are but how they think about these different issues and the problems that we face and then to have a conversation that starts before the election but i hope continues after the election okay so to help that happen these are some of our guidelines and i put them up on the in short form up on the whiteboard there so the first one is just speak for yourself okay not this is how i see it not how it is and we're going to try and not characterize someone else's point of view we're not going to have sense like unlike so and so. Okay, um, genuine questions—questions questions that you really don't know the answer to, as opposed to a leading question that you're trying to catch someone off guard. Listen for understanding. Okay, sometimes we ask a question and we're not even listening. We're kind of waiting, thinking about the next thing we're going to say. But let's try and pull, pull the best out of these, out of what our answers are. We know we're, we have lots of differences. Everyone in this room has something that makes their outlook unique. But we're gonna try and see if we can, we can acknowledge those differences, but also look for agreement. Tough soft means we're gonna be tough on the issues and soft on the people. Pretty simple. We, wanna be, we don't wanna be timid about soft because we got some big problems facing our community and our state. Share the air just means be as concise as you can be, okay? And then tonight, we're really limiting our conversation to issues that are facing Vermont most immediately. We're not gonna get into national politics, okay? That's not what this is about. We'll have other chances to do that, but not tonight, all right? And, it, and we, particularly things that we think the legislature has a, pro, a role for. There's not everything, the, the legislature, as you know, can't do everything. They have an important role, but they're not all powerful, okay? Um, so with that, I'm gonna invite, um, uh, Scott and Amanda to give their opening remarks and uh, we're gonna have a conversation thereafter. I'm gonna be sifting through some of your questions and we're gonna paraphrase them. Now given the size of our group, we may, have the, we're gonna, we may mix up the plan that I had for how we we're gonna do that, okay? But it was good that you write it down, wrote it down and thank you very much. So, um, and I would like to recognize, uh, again, Paul. Paul's gonna be helping with questions, but go ahead. Hi, Paul Fix, editor of the Hardwick Gazette. I, I just want to make sure everybody's aware this is being filmed. It will be broadcast on HCTV. The Gazette will be writing a story, and I may be taking pictures. So if anyone has any concerns about appearing in any of those things, now's the time to say so. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Okay. Take it away, Scott, if you would. Thank you, Jan. Um, thank you for everybody being here. Am I being, am I being picked up? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name's Scott Beck. I'm from St. Johnsbury. Um, just a couple minutes here. I was born in St. Johnsbury. Um, I was the uh, child in a military family, and I was in the military myself. So as I tell people, the first 30 years of my life, I traveled a lot. I've been to all 50 states. I've traveled all over the world. I went to 10 different public schools between kindergarten through 12th grade. But in 1999, as I ended my military service, I decided to move back to St. Johnsbury with my family, and I've been there ever since. Uh, I have six children, three boys, three girls. They are um, 
my youngest two are still in college and the other four are are out. Um, I've taught at St. Johnsbury Academy since 1999. I'm in my 26th year. I teach social studies, uh, mostly U.S. history. And my wife and I own the, the bookstore in St. Johnsbury. We've owned that for 20 years now. Uh, I'm also in a variety of different uh, groups in town that uh, help the community. Um, just, just leaving a three-year term as the president of Kiwanis that maintains the Kiwanis Pool, which provides swimming lessons for free for kids in this area. And I'm also on the, the board of Rink, and we maintain the skating facility up in Lindenville and, and a variety of other things that I do around the community. I've been in the legislature for um, finishing up my fifth term, my 10th year. I've been in the House of Representatives. I, uh, my first two terms, I was on House Education Committee. My last three terms, I've been on the House Ways and Means Committee, which is a fancy way of saying we write the tax law. Uh, and I'm also on the House Ethics Panel. Uh, my time in the legislature has been very productive. I've been able to get a lot of stuff through. I think it's been very beneficial to Vermont. We can probably talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but my politics, I've, I've um, always been, as I, as I say over there, you're either about politics or you're about policy in Montpelier. And I have decidedly been very heavy on the policy um, that's not to say that I don't dip my toes into politics when I have to to get something to move, but I spend most of my time over in the, the policy. Um, and I occupy the, the middle of the political spectrum. Uh, my colleagues have, have named me Legislator of the Year. I've also been rated recently as the most centrist uh, person in the House of Representatives. Um, my philosophy basically is to um, forget about the the political edges. Um, this job, I, um, and I look, I'm not trying to carve out 51% on either side of the political spectrum. I'm trying to carve out two thirds or three quarters or however big I can in the middle of the political spectrum. And um, that causes me to get yelled at by both edges of the political spectrum and that's just fine with me. I enjoy being there. Um, I can make a difference and when I go home every night or at the end of the session, I can honestly say that I represented as many people as possible, um, you know, middle, moderate Vermonters, and uh, don't get too caught up in the, the edge work of politics. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. Amanda. Thank you. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Amanda Cochran and I'm also running for the Senate seat in our Caledonia district, but I think you put that together. Um, I've been, um, for those of you who don't know my background, um, most recently I've been running Umbrella, which is like a wear that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but in serving the Northeast Kingdom, the th in Orleans, Caledonia, and um, in Essex, it doesn't include this part of Caledonia. Um, and um, I live in St. Johnsbury with my family. I have three children, um, and my husband uh, lives with us too, as does my mom. Um, and so that's a little bit about our family. Um, but I, you know, one of the questions I think we had tonight to just think about and, and how I introduce myself is to share kind of why I'm running. And so I just wanted to share with you a little bit more about that. Um, and so it really begins in, in May, so not that long ago, but back in, in May, um, I was honored when Jane Kitchell called to ask if I'd consider running in her seat. Um, you know, as somebody who's advocated in the legislature, having someone at her stature even consider that I could, I could do that um, was a big um, honor, uh, to say the least. And so I had to think back and, and about my career and say, like, you know, what has prepared me for this moment? Um, and so, you know, I thought back to one of my first jobs after college, um, which was um, to do AmeriCorps. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's like the Peace Corps, but, you know, domestic. And so I was doing an after, working at an after school program at a large organization that was like a NECA and an NEKHS, NKHS um, put together. So it was this large organization that served almost every need in the community. Um, and about halfway through my term there, um, our checks began to bounce and the organization ended up going under. Um, and so from that moment, it really struck me that the importance of community-based organizations and their fiscal management, something had went wrong. Um, and as somebody whose, whose sister suffers from mental health disorder um, and you know she would have been 
kind of left on the street with no support. And that was support that's really life-saving for her. So it really was a wake-up call for me and kind of put me on the trajectory that I have been on in my career, which is to, um, you know, to really to think about the fiscal management of, of community-based uh, organizations. And so that took me to get my MBA in nonprofit management um, and then go on to be administrative roles and director roles at organizations that worked on child welfare, um, gender-based violence and you know, substance misuse, um, and environmental justice. So, um, but really always in that, in that ilk of wanting to um, you know, support the efficiency of organizations so that they were really working to meet their missions. Um, so that brought me back to like thinking, to thinking about, you know, is this the moment? Do I have, you know, I felt like, yeah, I have some really valuable experience to share, but is this the moment? And then, you know, really looking around to our beautiful region, um, you know, I, I was kind of, the light was getting dark as I was coming in here, but just the beauty of our surrounding area. We're so lucky to live in this place, but there are so many real challenges here. Uh, we face, you know, climate crisis with all the flooding that we've recently experienced. We, ex we um, you know, people are struggling to make ends meet um, with property taxes increasing and, um, you know, so many challenges that, that people are facing with housing, finding housing, being able to afford housing, et cetera. And I think we'll get into more of those topics in more detail tonight. Um, but it felt like this was really an important moment to dive in. And so what do I feel like I can offer? You know, I, what I feel like I can offer is a strong voice from our region. I've spent my career speaking on behalf of, of folks mar marginalized in many different ways, whether that's experiencing substance misuse or being abused or, um, you know, what, what have you, being from a disadvantaged background. I feel like I have those skills of persuasion, of passion to be able to lend to that kind of setting in the legislature that, that would be really needed. I think I could be a strong voice for our region. Um, and I also think I have, I've, I've shown some innovation. I think it's really important to solve our many intractable problems. We can't just keep trying the same thing over and over again and think it's going to work. We have to try new things. And sometimes that means thinking in new ways. Some of that um, can be ex exemplified in you know, a project that I was part of starting in St. Johnsbury called the St. Johnsbury Community Hub. It's kind of similar to Civic Standard. It's like a cousin of the Civic Standard. Um, but you know, really understanding that there was a big gap in our community from, from people being really not able to not not connecting up, um, among you know socioeconomic backgrounds people weren't connecting in the same ways that that I think community should and so we kind of created this opportunity for people to come together um, in a place that was judgment free and where they could really um, get to know one another and, and really build social capital among people who don't just have it all right so they can get connected to jobs get connected to um, meeting people that could help them in their careers and in their lives so I, f I think innovative thinking is something that I would want to bring to to um, the legislature. And finally, I think we need a strong, vo a strong moderate voice in the in the Senate. Um, we've we are we've lost a lot of uh, moder moderate senators this last cycle with retirement and and folks passing. Um, and it's been it's really important that we have um, somebody who has that strong voice in the majority party, so that we can bring our you know region. Um, can really be able to be heard. Um, unfortunately, that's just how politics work. Is that my button to be? To sh <laughs> no. No, <Okay>. that's. <laughs> it's you, not me. Okay. Okay. I, I was I was just concluding anyway. So thank you. You're doing um, great. Yeah. You're doing fine. Yeah. So I, I was basically kind of finished with my my opening remarks there, but just to say, you know, I think it's important that we do have um, someone um, in the majority party who is a strong voice for us. So thank you. Awesome, Amanda. And I just want to invite folks that, you know, there's going to be a follow-up. We're going to have, go into some questions that, based on the cards that you guys have submitted, but be thinking about follow-up questions. You know, something that they said. Uh, for me, for example, Amanda talked about innovation. You know, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to Amanda? What does that maybe mean to Scott, okay? So just be prepared for, so I'm going to let you know what we've got for questions so far. Could you give me yours there? Thank you. Um, so just to be clear about the format, they're going to both respond to the same. So there's not going to be questions just for one candidate or another, OK? But the things that we have so far um, are there's some major funding issues related to schools. Um, we have a property tax model right now, so there was a question about, about that. Um, there was a question about the role of the legislature, how do we make you know, the Vermont legislature more effective as a body, that it's, it seems to be 
you know, maybe somewhat not fully equipped to deal with what the challenges we have. Like, it takes a long time to 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 move to get something done in in in, in uh, the state house. School lunches, universal school lunches. That was a question. That topic, universal pre-K. Where do we where do we look at that? Um, what models or examples? Um, from either Vermont or other states, even other countries, have, do you think of that you would like to maybe be a, you know, useful to borrow for in Vermont? Um, so then there's uh, some other questions for when, uh, so when Sabrina joins us a little later, we got some, some questions specific to, to um, to her, what, how she might be different from, from uh, our current representative, Chip Triano. Okay, so the idea is we're not necessarily gonna get to everything tonight, right? The, the idea was that people give an idea to, um, to see how they, how they break down any issue. So I can just say I hear a lot about, you know, people's ability to afford living in this state, in this town. So let's, let's, go, to, let's go to school funding first, if we could. Uh, Scott, why don't you go, why don't you st start off and then we'll alternate. So I think probably everybody in this circle has um, received a property tax or have been impacted by a property tax that was received this year. Um, the, you know, Vermont has a, it's a, it's a very unusual, it's a one-off um, funding system. Nobody else in the country does it like this and, um, a lot of that is because of a court case back in the late uh, late 90s. But um, I'll be the you know the per this this fund is is e actually easily fixable. Um, there are only three things you have to do to it, and one of them I got I got through last year, and that was the uh, the reform of the common level of appraisal. That's the mechanism that makes sure that everybody in every town is paying an equal amount into a into the into the education fund for their spending, and that's fixed. Um, it'll be fixed starting in FY26, and it's really wonky and really technical. Uh, it's probably not worth going through right here, in uh, this group. Um, but when December one hits, everybody will kind of figure it out. Um, the other thing that we need to do is also a transparency issue. We have three transparency issues. Uh, one, is, the second one is that our districts, um, their spending decision is not very closely um, connected to their tax rate. Uh, districts, um, they hold the line, their rates go up because a different district made a different decision and they don't feel very connected um, and that's not a good recipe for slowing down spending. Uh, it's also not a good recipe for finding savings. Uh, we can easily fix that. Um, you know, it, the House has passed a version of it in 2018, we almost did it in 22. 24 this year it was one day from getting out of House Ways and Means. Um, a special interest group came in and said, "Nope, we're not going to do that." But all we have to do is just take all the all the taxes that are paid by people other than the the homestead taxpayers, give it out to districts as a weighted grant. It'd be very generous, probably about ten thousand dollars a kid, and then just continue to let the districts spend what they want to and put them on a yield. That will that will much more closely connect the district to the spending decision. Those two things alone will fix the system, so it'll work out was intended to work. The third thing is more for understanding uh, for the, the people, and that's to reform the property tax credit. Right now, the way that thing is structured, nobody knows if they're paying on their property value or their income or both. There are caps, there are rate thresholds. It's a mess. Nobody understands how their uh, property tax is determined. We can fix that by doing what I think 49, uh, 49 other states do, which is you just pay your property tax bill in the fall, and then you get an income tax credit when you file in the spring. That's how every other state does it. We've come up with this just Byzantine, not understandable um, system, and if we just move to that, then everybody could understand how the whole thing works, and, and, and it'll work how it's supposed to, and it'll, people will be able to understand it. It really is, it really is that simple. Um, but there are people in Montpelier that love an opaque system where people do not understand the implications of their spending decisions. So that's going to be a little bit of a, a battle, 
but I think um, it's a battle that can be won in the next couple years. Thank you very much. Again, be thinking about follow-up questions because that's what we'll go to after Amanda. Yeah, thanks for the question. This is certainly, you know, something that we we hear all the time. Anybody going door to door, anybody in any forums, this is really a very, it's often number one on the list of voters, I think, in our district. So it's a really important topic. Um, you know, and I agree with Scott that it's it's really too hard to understand for folks, and that's a problem because if even school board members really don't understand how the formula works, I think we're you know not doing anyone a service of having them weigh in if we don't even on the budgets if we don't understand it right it's not it's not a good good way to be set up um, you know I think if it was you know as easy as one two three I think we would have done it right there's complications that um, that happen with this, it's really a complicated and nuanced system. And so, you know, for me as a person looking in, you know, really from, from the outside and, and looking at this, this topic, some, some things have occurred to me um, around how we're, how we're structuring our, our school budgets. And, and one of those is, is really asking, because again, I, I know many of you have heard the stats, but we're increasing the amount of money we're, that schools are getting, provi are getting provided, but our education outcomes aren't increasing. And, and, and so we're kind of in this situation that's not, it's not really helping. More money isn't necessarily making education better, right? And maybe we're measuring the wrong things, right? So that's another kind of side question there. Um, but, but one of the things that you know, occurred to me was that you know, wh while we have a really important mental health crisis going on and kids need mental health support and they need it connected to the school, Maybe we have to think about how we fund that separately from the education funding that we have, that we provide in the state. You know, there is designated agencies. There are other kinds of programs that fund schools that aren't necessarily part of the budget making process. And I think we could maybe get a little smarter about how we're doing that and maybe have some guardrails in place around how we're what we're kind of allowing to be part of the school budget. Um, that includes construction costs as well. So a lot, of t a lot of schools are having a lot of issues with you know, their building and their, in their um, physical plant. That's really important, and I, I don't want us to say it any way that I don't think that's really important. But to put capital expenses in an operating budget is really unusual, um, and it really skews the budget numbers. And so I think it's important to come up with, and I don't know exactly how you do it, but is there, are there opportunities to look at funding construction or capital expenses outside of education fund and, and putting it somewhere else and looking at for opportunities there? Um, and lastly, I think we need to really consider looking at you know, staff ratios and staff student ratios and administrative positions within school budgets. Like just, just look at guardrails that are still allowing schools to thrive and kids to thrive, but just being a little bit more, um, I guess, careful about that. Um, and also really, really valuing how we partner with other organizations. A simple example, um, I'm part of a group that um, helps to support substance misuse prevention um, it gives out grants in the community, okay? So we, we give ten to $20,000 grants. Our schools in the Northeast Kingdom, they don't apply. They, not because they don't need the money, right? We know that they need money, and especially for like prevention and intervention around like kids and vaping and all this stuff. We know this is really important, but they're not applying because I think a simple reason, because the money is coming out available outside of the budget time frame. Right, They've, the budget, the money's coming out in late, you know, after the after town meeting. So it doesn't it doesn't make sense for them to apply. So and that's a those those types of grant opportunities are from the state. That's from the Department of Health. That's where it originates. So can we get smarter as a, as a state about how we're supporting supporting schools and do it in ways that they can access it? Um, so those are just some some ideas around around that piece. Awesome. I would invite anyone to pose a follow-up question regarding funding. Did anything catch your, your attention? Um, um, thank you. I'm just wondering, um, there was a little bit, Mr. Beck, right? Um, I didn't understand about where the $10,000 came from when you were talking about that. That's number one follow-up. Number two, what are either of your thoughts 
on having funding come from income tax. So just to answer your first question there, yeah, 10, if you take all the, the taxes that are paid by the non-homestead property owners, the commercial, and if you take all of the consumption taxes, sales tax being the biggest one, pay all the categorical aid and what you have left over, divided by the number of the number of kids in the state, comes out to about ten thousand dollars a weighted a weighted student, and there are far more weighted students than there are actual students in the state of Vermont. So that's where that number comes from. Yeah, and the second part of your question was remind me. Um, income tax thoughts oh, income on, tax. on an alternative. Yeah. Alternative to so, property tax. Yeah. So right now, um, about two-thirds of the people that pay the property tax, the homestead property tax, do pay based on income. Um, I was actually, is it two, three years ago now, I was on the, the summer um, commission that looked at this idea of going to an income tax. And it has been kicked around for a long time, this idea. And then finally somebody said, okay, well, could we even do it? Like, is this even workable? Does it make any sense? And so we sat on that, I sat on that commission with um, a number of different, uh, about, there was a half dozen of us, three senators, three representatives. And um, it, it's, I wouldn't say it's in, impossible, but um, it would be very, very difficult to move to that type of system. Uh, and then once you get past the implementation of it, um, is the uh, you would be putting so much of state government on one tax stream that you're that you know you're you're inducing a lot of instability into the system. Not to mention when you start um, adding income tax on top of income tax on top of income tax, um, we're we you know we're we're already not very competitive um, with other states as far as income tax is concerned. And to jack that up even more, I think you'd um, you'd risk some serious flight out of the state, and you'd probably um, risk some um, hiding, uh, legally hiding of money. Uh, I mean, all somebody with a, a you know account has to do is put all their money in treasuries. Boom, they're exempt from all income taxes. That's federal law. So there was a lot of reasons not to not to go there. Um, it we did the work, we studied it. And it it doesn't it, it doesn't seem to be a very good idea. Amanda. Yeah, I mean, I I think um, I think no idea should be off the table, right? I think we should always be looking at opportunities to improve how we do things. Um, having said that, you know, we have a system. There are positives about it. Right now, we're in a bad situation because of multiple things that all happened at the same time that have you know, jacked up the property tax rates. Um, but I think I think we should first really look at making some tweaks and you know making some adjustments. I think that would be a priority, less kind of um, uh, disruptive, to try to try to work with what we have to improve our system in some of the ways that I shared, but I'm sure many legislators have other really, you know, compelling reasons and, and um, ideas about how to do that so that then, um, and see if that is really going to help solve that problem. But I think just generally in terms of the way I personally think, I think we should always, always be open to ideas, opportunities, what other folks or places are doing, right, and trying to learn from that and see if they can apply here. But um, other follow-up questions on this topic? Thank, thank you. Um, for both of you, I think Scott mentioned the possibility of changing how the property tax credit system works and moving to a, a straight tax situation where you'd pay your property tax and then deduct it from your income taxes. I think there are people in Vermont, A, who pay so little income tax that the deduction doesn't help them. And there are people who can't afford that extra funding when their tax bills do. And so our property tax credit does help those low income Vermonters not have to dig as deep into their pockets when the tax bill comes. If each of you could could respond to, you know, how how whether whether what I've said you know, maybe I'm out of line, and maybe you have other ideas about how to deal with that. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a real concern, Paul, but I think it's pretty easily addressed. You can just make the credit a non-refundable credit, and that way they get the credit regardless of what their liability is. That, that's commonly done in tax policy. So that one can be dispensed of pretty quickly. As far as the, um, you know, you pay in the fall um, property tax and you do it in, uh, you do your income filing in the spring. Um, like I mean, I think 48 states do it that way. What makes Vermont a little bit unusual is, is our credit is quite high compared to a lot of the other states. So yes, you would have to have a, a, a cash flow protector in there for somebody to, you know, you can push off the payment or something to take care of those people. But I mean, generally speaking, cash flow problems are, are fairly easy problems to, to solve. Other follow-up questions on this topic? I'm, oh, I'm sorry. My apologies, everyone. Those in the room, those at home. Amanda, please. Um, I mean, I think I agree with how you framed that, Paul, actually. Um, I think, you know, cash flow might be able to be dealt with um, in cert in, with certain strategies, but it's just something else to kind of administer. And I think, um, you know, I, I would agree that the way that it's set up right now is, is probably um, the most helpful for people's month-to-month um, -month and cash spends. So if you don't mind, I, happened, I was an educator for a short period of time. Um, but I've always been interested in education for a long time. And but what I've seen most, most recently is that it's, a, it's an incremental, I mean, we're, so we've been talking about the revenue side. Let's talk about the spending side, the expense side. And uh, I don't know if we know if it's the same reason, the same explanation. It's like there's all these, there's multiple reasons why budgets are going through the roof. And having seen the inside of schools, it seems like it's no one's fault. It's just this incremental process. So I guess I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how to take a hard look at the spending side and what, what kids really need versus what, you know, the, the inertia of school budgets. I mean, I feel like I kind of address that in my response just generally, or at least, you know, my thoughts around that with looking at other ways to fund things like mental health um, challenges and capital expenses and some of these drivers. The other drivers that you can't really change are like health insurance for teachers and, you know, um, salaries and things, which, I, which our teachers, you know, deserve to be paid for their really important work, right? And, and of course, healthcare costs are out of, out of the hands of the education um, system. So I, I, I feel like the, the things like that I mentioned, I mean, looking at ratios, a lot of schools are very small. Um, you know, and that's a really sticky subject, right? Uh, you know, people love their small schools sometimes in their communities. Sometimes they don't love their small schools in the communities. I've seen just by, you know, kind of going um, town to town. It really depends on what town you're in um, and how, what they think about their kind of small school, right? And so I think it's important to kind of look at that as a case by case and not just say, oh no, we can't have sm school, small schools. But I do think it's important to look at ratios and really make sure that we're spending money um, on our, you know, where, you know, teachers aren't, aren't serving three kids, right? I think that doesn't make a lot of sense financially or really for them either, right? It's really hard to learn in a, in a classroom where there's only a couple kids in it. It's a much different experience when there's 20 kids and you're having a much richer experience or, or 10 kids at least, right? And so I think there's some, some levers that I hadn't mentioned before around that ratio piece. Yeah, I mean, so the economics of it are is that um, in a, typically in a school, 80% of the budget is to pay for the people in the building, salary and benefits, healthcare being the number one. Vermont has, in our schools, we have a four to one ratio of kids to adults. The next lowest state is Maine, they're 4.8, and the national average is 7.5. And that's where all the money is. You can't, you can't sugarcoat it. That's where all the money is. Um, it has been studied. And this, the conclusion of the study, and this is, it's borne out in the study and it's borne out anecdotally, we'll hear from people that work in schools, is that the number of educators in the state of Vermont is about right and about what you expect for a small rural state that has to operate small schools. 
where the number is not correct is in all of the other support staff that are in the, the school. That's, and we have teachers that come to this state from other states and they'll, they'll write us and they'll say, this is, I had like a bunch of them from the western states last year, Colorado, Wyoming, they're, they're like, I taught in a school and I came to Vermont and now I'm teaching in a school and you cannot believe how many non-educators are in this building. And that's, that's, where the, that's where the money is. I mean, the way it works out mathematically, if we could get to five to one, which I mean, we'd still be on the, like the top of the, we'd still be at the top, it would save $300 million. Last year, uh, Larry Pikus um, studying uh, Vermont and, and uh, what we should be spending, he said we could actually spend $400 million less and offer a better education than we are now. Um, so I think that's, <coughs> that's, that's the key. We have to get the staffing levels right in the schools. We can't, we can't you know, four to one when 80% of the cost is um, employees. I mean, you're, you're never gonna get out of that hole unless you, uh, you address your staffing ratios. Thank you very much, Scott. So we're gonna move to a different topic and um, the topic is uh, universal pre-K. That's three to five years old before kindergarten. <coughs> So I guess I invite um, either, both candidates to talk about if they have a, their general position, but also how they think about that issue of, you know, all the research that shows how much, how invaluable, how important that is as a opportunity equalizer. We're gonna, we said we would alternate, so Amanda's gonna go first and then Scott, okay? Great. No, I love the question and we are, not moving from education, but no, I was kidding. Um, but it's really, we must have some educators in the room, maybe, I don't know. But it's super important um, as, you know, so an umbrella, some of you might not be aware, but the organization actually administers child care financial assistance. Um, and so I, I mentioned that because I think what our state passed last year with this landmark, landmark legislation, Act 76, that has put into place like like no other uh, no other time before, childcare um, uh, availability is going to skyrocket in our communities. Um, we're seeing already with this passage of this of this new legislation that um, you know people are coming into Umbrella. They have they've never been able to qualify for financial assistance, and now they are. That's making a difference of like for some people seven hundred dollars a week. Uh, in childcare, they won't have to pay. That's enabling a lot of moms to go back into the workforce, um, and and it's enabling also, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, people who are hiring to be able to hire those those uh, parents now who are able to go back into the workforce. And so I mentioned that. I know it's not exactly the question you asked, but I mention it because to me, I think it's really important to see how that plays out. Because a lot of these now entrepreneurs, these childcare providers, they, they, there might, we might, we are beginning to see more openings happening. Um, in our, in the Northeast Kingdom, we are seeing more spaces opening up. I believe we're going to continue to see that. We're going to see maybe more op um, actual centers opening up. And often centers can provide preschool. They can they can provide those kinds of um, opportunities for for the youngest of the kid of our kids. And so I think we should see how that plays out um, as a first step to looking at universal pre-K. Um, I think our universal K program has been wonderful, um, but I think. For me, I think I would want to kind of see how Act 76 really plays out and, and how it grows the education opportunities for our, our youngest, and then um, look at you know other opportunities as they come come along, and then also how you pay for that, right? Um, so that's what I would say. Awesome, Amanda. Thank you, Scott. So uh, universal pre-K it passed out of the legislature the year before I went in, so I didn't vote on it. But I was in house education my first two terms, and uh, we were tasked with trying to fix it right away, and it became very obvious very quickly that it, it was not really fixable. <laughs> um, what we've done is we've created a system where basically our private providers um, are kind of fighting with our public schools for for kids, um, and and those private providers they have invested a lot of capital money to to get those programs up and running. Um, the schools, of course, want those kids badly for the counts. 
Um, the NEA's position is they want to end the private uh, the private model. I don't think that'll that'll happen. So I think we're we're kind of stuck with with what we have, and we've got to make it work. Um, but it is it it's a really it's a really difficult system to work. There's no there's no standard. There's no consistency. Every school district's doing their own thing. Then you layer special education on top of it. It becomes even messier. Um, and I what you know I hear from districts from time to time that are like, "Can you fix this?" And I I honestly I, I don't think it. I mean, if fixing means going to an all private or an all public school, that's not going to happen. Those wars are not, you know, human services and education. They are not. That's not gonna. That's not gonna happen. So my advice to school districts is: is take the bull by the horns. You know, you know your unique circumstances on the ground, and what you have for assets, both public and private, and make the thing work locally. Um, and I, in a lot of cases, that's what districts are doing. But it has created this huge inconsistency across the entire state, and it's um. You know, I, I said I wasn't in the room when those decisions were made, but um, I, I, th I think any everybody that was part of it afterwards really wished they made a different decision. It was also it was supposed to cost three million dollars. It very quickly ran up to forty million dollars, so it didn't even meet the cost projections that uh, the Joint Fiscal Office put out there. So um, I guess what I'd have to say is is that. What we have is probably what we have, and every community should do whatever they can do to make it work best for them. Um, and don't worry about trying to do what other communities are doing. I think you have a follow-up question. I think so. <laughs> um, I, I was a public school teacher, and, and then I became a, a Waldorf teacher. And, um, it, um, and I know if I had children, I wouldn't want my pre-K in a public school as I understand them. And I'm wondering if, if there's any um, chance that we could have a charter school system or, or something else to serve the children, if there's any talk of that. Who wants to go first? Um, there isn't any talk of that. Um, I'm not an expert on charter schools. Um, Vermont doesn't have any charter school law. Um, but the, um, I, I can tell you the Vermont NEA and the superintendents and the school boards, they want to have no part of, no part of that. That would be a non-starter for those groups. Arizona and, and it worked very well. Yeah. Other states have them and, and, you know, I, I don't have any experience with them. I've never, um, I've never lived or had taught or had kids in a in, in a charter school or in a state that had charter schools. My kids received their K through 12 education all in Vermont. But, um, yeah, it, it's I wouldn't. I mean, somebody could throw a bill in, but I don't think it's I don't think it's going to find a receptive audience. Um, it, I don't think it would move anywhere. Sorry, that disappoints you. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have much more to add. Um, I think it's, again, always worth looking at um, and seeing how they have lots of different kinds of charter schools. Some are public, some are private. Um, yeah, there's different ways to look at it, but having been no precedent here in Vermont, I think, you know, it'd be something to, to try to ramp up, but worth looking at and just like, yeah. I, I will add um, that Burlington actually runs, they're not charter schools, they run a couple of uh, magnet schools um, where they one's an, one's arts focused, I think the other one is STEM focused, um, and they're able to do that because they have, I wouldn't say they have population mass, but they have more population mass than we do in this in most areas of Vermont. But they are they are nibbling on the edge of of that. A more arts based and nature based curriculum in our schools, and I don't yeah. know how one goes about having that happen. I, local control, your school district, your school board. Okay, so we do have some other questions that are teed up, but I'm going to take moderator liberty and mix it up a little bit, okay? I would, I'm going to ask if you guys have some questions that you didn't write down on a card that you 
did something that you've heard prompt a different kind of question? Um, go ahead. Well, I just, um, you, you mentioned the, the ratio of educators to non uh, I don't know, non-teachers. And, and who are those, all those non-teachers? It, it's it's all support staff. You know your teachers. That's your that's your your steam teachers, your classroom teachers, your special education teachers, and um, your specials, gym. And then you have everybody everybody else in that school. Um, and that's the number that appears to be out of whack with what um, educational norms are. So like paraprofessionals and admins. And, you know, other kinds of roles like, you know, um, administrative roles. Other questions? Okay. We're going to um, bring the focus out a little bit. And I'm going to invite you guys to talk about either pol specific policies or ways of doing business that you have, meaning legislatures and government, in other places or other towns or just programs that you are fond of or have noticed and said like, gee, shouldn't we do that here in Vermont? Or maybe we could, maybe we could learn something. Is there, you know, just you can, you can say that you focus just on trying to figure out Vermont, but that was a question that was, that was put out. Like just how do we get better, you know, how do we be a learning, kind of a state when it comes to these problems? Well, if you're, if you're talking about the, <clears throat> the way a legislature actually operates, um, the first thing I think we could really benefit from is not having a supermajority in this state any longer. Um, what that has done um, is, you know, normally when you don't have a supermajority, the, the political conversation swirls around the middle because both sides need each other, even if one side is larger than the other. But it swirls around the middle. When you have a supermajority, the policy conversation doesn't swirl around the middle. It swirls around the middle of the supermajority. And the supermajority um, is, it's a, you know, it's a combination of a lot of progressives and a lot of Democrats. And the, that conversation has shifted far to the left. Um, that is how we end up with things like 14% property tax increases. That's how we end up with 20% DMV fee increases. And that's how we end up with billion dollar electric rate increases and this clean heat standard that people are talking about right now. So as far as how the legislature works, for it to work for all Vermonters is we need to get rid of this supermajority and get back to something that represents the middle. As far as more granular, you know, I've been to a few conferences with uh, legislators from um, other states, and <clears throat> boy, I will tell you that the, the variety of how legislatures do business around the United States could not be more diverse. I mean, it is, it is stark when you talk to legislators from other states about their numbers and campaigning and committee assignments, and I mean, it's it, support staff. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of states, they have a lot of support staff, which would be great. I'd love to have a policy support person, staff person in Montpelier. With that being said, I don't think that's probably going to happen. Most of the policy work has to be done by the legislator. Uh, one thing I think is kind of interesting, I think this is true over in New Hampshire and a few other states. Uh, it's, it's pretty wonky. It's pretty nuanced. But I think it, it speeds the conversation along and it frees up people's times to act, time to actually focus on what's important. Is, um, bills are submitted as long form bills or short form bills. And a long form bill is like, it could be dozens and dozens of pages with all the minutia and everything. And you throw that in there and it really ties up the legislative staff and the joint fiscal office staff's time. Whereas a short bill is just like a summary bill that goes in to see if the idea sticks. And then if it does, you really dig into it. And I think a lot of times over in Montpelier, we're, we are really, by people trying to put in all these long form bills, we're really wasting uh, the time of our legislative office and our joint fiscal office on ideas that are never really going to see the light of day because they have no support 
and a lot of states they require that all bills go in a short form and I think that might be a simple way to for Vermont to still have a wide breadth of ideas come into the conversation but save our human resources really to only work on the ideas that have broad enough political support to actually make it to the finish line. Thank you, Scott. Um, and I, I, so to answer your question, I think, you know, the, you know, yes, I could talk about all the many different programs, particularly around the um, community-based kind of uh, issue focused area of, of organizations that I think are doing really great, states that I think are really doing great. But I think what's really important um, in order to lift up ideas that can really work and have lasting power is to listen, right? And to listen to community members who are dealing with that particular challenge, to listen with groups who have that real knowledge about that particular piece of legislation and hear from them what their ideas are. Because oftentimes the people that are closest to whatever the issue might be are going to have the best ideas. They're going to really understand the nuance. They're going to understand the unintended consequences, right? And so I think I think that would be something if I were to be elected that I would figure out a way to get that feedback loop from our constituents here um, as an example to be whether it's a survey whether it's you know meetings every quarter what have you to be able to really understand what are the big topics and what are those who are those those experts right that are in our communities so expert with like a lowercase e um, who are on the ground and who are working on these issues so that we can I think you know find solutions that are going to work here and like compare that with what has worked other places similarly right don't um, be kind of smart about it that's how you know we've we've tried to at umbrella for example you know come up with new approaches has been through listening to the community first and then looking at okay wh who's done this before let's look at best practices around that topic of of what that community need wanted was and then let's match that and move forward and so i think the same kind of thing can happen with policy uh, development and, and would be a, an ethic that I would bring to the, you know, that kind of work. Um, but I also think what we lack, or what I've observed that's kind of lacking, is vision in our state. Um, you know, we, we've had a really strong governor who, who was here for us during some of the most trying times in like COVID, right? Um, felt very comforted by his, his great leadership during that time and during um, flooding, during the great, like the years now of floods that we've had that have been really challenging. There's been a lot of support. But what I'd be looking for, I think, as a legislator would be vision coming from the executive branch, but also that could then trickle down. Because, for example, one of the, we haven't talked about it yet tonight, but I think one of the biggest challenges that we have in our, in our state is housing, right? And housing is like a linchpin. There's so many issues that are connected to housing. Um, you know, studies, are sh studies have shown that between, you know, 2025 and 2029, we need 24 to 36 136,000, you know, housing, housing units to be developed. That's a lot, right? We need a vision to create that. 25% um, of renters are paying more than half their income um, for housing. And fewer people can afford a home. Um, you know, the, the, the statistics go on and on about housing. And I think if we are to really have a vision, a visionary approach to looking at this issue, because it's not just affordable housing. We, we added a bunch of affordable housing, that's not gonna solve our problem, right? But if we are looking at the continuum of, of homelessness and how we can support people, if we're looking at how, you know, if we increase housing, we're gonna, it's gonna improve mental health, it's gonna improve health healthcare costs, right? If people don't have to, um, if you don't have to pay for uh, folks who are um, coming in to work at the hospital who aren't living there, right? The temporary employees, they are charged way more, driving our health care costs up. If we have folks who are housed, they're not going to be as, uh, you know, as, as likely to come to the emergency room because of their health care issues from living outside, right? So housing can really be this linchpin that could, you know, property taxes, uh, labor, right? It hits every issue. And so how do we how do we have? How do we help support that vision and also encourage that vision to be created so that we can solve that really big problem? Thank you, Amanda. <clears throat> so um, we are nearing, but not quite at the point where we're going to invite the. So you talked about vision, um, and you're going to have that point where you guys can talk about anything you want. You don't have to um, s not has answer any particular question that we have. But before we do that, I'm going to invite Paul. 
Fix, um, editor of the Hardwick Gazette, to, uh, to pose one more topical question. Okay, well, uh, Jan mentioned this a second ago, and I was leaning towards housing, which Amanda has talked to, but Scott hasn't. But let me talk about the challenge I see for you folks in Caledonia County Senate in particular. First of all, Caledonia County's largest town is barely a blip in Chittenden County. Uh, Caledonia County's smallest town, Stannard, it doesn't even exist in, in, in Chittenden County. I'm sorry, did I say Caledonia? Um, so there's a, there's a big discrepancy in our, in our county alone between various things. And housing and homelessness are, are related. Here in Hardwick, uh, well, actually in Greensboro, I know a pastor who has gone so far as to drive someone who needed help to Chittenden County and say there's help here. Because from here, if you were homeless, you have to go to St. Johnsbury or Hyde Park or Newport or Barrie. There's, there's no help for you right here in Hardwick. And Hardwick is sort of outside of the St. Johnsbury, Lindenville corridor. So we're over here. Some government programs we go to Lamoille for. We're in a really bizarre spot here. Um, so so if, if we were to provide housing here or in Caledonia County for homeless people because of the lack of housing that Amanda just talked about, we're probably displacing somebody who could afford to pay something. And so the lack of housing is a real issue. I think sometimes I hear those in the state house refer to the issues with rising property taxes as a result of COVID as, as the problem, but it was a problem before that. This is something the state has been kicking down the road for a long time. So while, while you two talk in slightly different ways about where to find solutions, I, I really ask you on behalf of those of us here in Caledonia County, what, what can you do to put the vision, the bean counting, all of those things in place to, to help us get our share of those 36,000 units in the next five years? Scott, go ahead. Well, I think, you know, I, I just try to, I think a lot of people in Montpelier, they're not, they're, they're identifying the, you know, that these, the lack of units is, is the, the cause of homelessness and a lot of other things, including the cost of living. But what I think we've kind of been focused on over there, a lot of people have been focused on is how do you somehow cobble together enough public funds to solve the, the problem? You know, this last year there was a, a plan for $900 million um, to build, I think it was only 4,000 units. Um, and people were seriously like considering that. Um, in fact, it actually um, passed the House of Representatives. I, I didn't vote for it. I could not believe we were gonna we were gonna spend nine hundred million dollars for four thousand units. But that was their perspective. Um, you know, I mean, I think we really need to be honest about what the the problem is with housing. The problem with housing is is that to cost to construct or to renovate is far more than than is justified. I mean, you can't have a system and a set of um, permitting and regulation and where a $300,000 house costs $400,000 to build because the only people that can build in that scenario are the people with a lot of cash. And that's what you see with builders around here. You know, you talk to them. It's like, hey, what do you, you, know, what do you got the next two or three summers? Oh, I got, I'm building three quarters right now. I got a three quarter next year and I got a, I got a million dollar home in 2026, all cash. And that's what they're building. And the reason they're building that is because it doesn't make any sense for a developer or a builder to build the, the worker housing that we need. And it, if we don't solve that problem, I mean, there is not enough public money to build all of the housing that we need. We have got to do the tough work. The governor had a lot of things that he wanted in the Act 250 reform bill this year to start to get at that. They all got shaved out, and he got overridden on the veto. But 
you know, I, I want what I want to see around here in, in Hardwick and in Saint, yeah, I, mean, I want to see a developer show up and and make a lot of money building apartments and houses that people around here can afford. But right now they won't do it because they they lose money. It's it's a total losing proposition for themselves. I mean, our market is so out of whack. I mean, if you're from around here, it's been like it's been like that in the Northeast Kingdom for 25 or 30 years. Now everybody's focusing on it because our problem has spread to the rest of the state. But if if we can't get the cost to construct down to a level where it makes sense for builders, developers, and homeowners, we're screwed because there isn't enough public money to solve the problem. Amanda. Yeah, so I, I spoke a little bit about this topic already, but you know, in terms of uh, you know, Caledonia County, yes, is, I've been at Umbrella for seven years, and for seven years, we, it's really hard to find apartments for people. Like we, it's one of those things. Like, oh, how are we going to find this apartment? We we managed to do it for you know for folks, but it's it's really hard, and it's been that way um, for sure. And you know, I think I think yeah, we can't. This can't be a totally publicly funded initiative, right? It's going to take. It's a it's a major, complex, multifaceted problem that has multifaceted um you know challenges related to it and it's going to take multiple ways of addressing it um act 250 and reform and and that kind of thing is part of it and there are other you know other important pieces of it the homelessness piece is part of it right when we look at um you know creating creating more solutions for that particularly issue, particular issue i think Adding more homeless shelters would be support, would be helpful um, for getting folks housed, um, as an example. But that's part of a housing solution, right? And so I think just looking at all the different ramifications of when there isn't housing, when the housing is in such disrepair, et cetera, and looking at how we can um, work on that in in the within different types of of bills, different types of policies, um, and different um, areas of government, so that it's it's not just like the one housing housing thing, but that it's it's really um, comprehensive because the problem is that big and and it has that many ramifications. Awesome. <clears throat> Follow up questions on on that topic. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna <laughs> beg. Oh, no. Roger. Hopefully this will be useful. Is anybody aware of uh, other locations in the United States uh, that are having more success dealing with housing? I think I think it's important to look at the rural example, and I you know I don't have a rural example off the, the top of my head, but there are lots of lots of cities and and you know large towns doing uh, interesting things. You know, if you looked at the housing study that I think um, that that I referenced earlier, um, one of the things that is needed are how homes that are for one to three three people in it, right? We have a lot of these houses that are for a lot more, right? When when generations live together, et cetera. Um, and so the need isn't for these large, you know, million dollar kind of McMansions here. They're a lot smaller. And so there's some zoning and some interesting things I think out of Milwaukee, for, as an example, they're doing in much smaller lots and really looking at encouraging, you know, teaching municipalities, encouraging municipalities to look at different ways of zoning so that you can put these smaller homes in a, in a smaller kind of um, footprint than you may have typically been allowed um, as an example. But I think there's p plenty that we can learn from, um, and I think we, we should definitely be, be looking to do that. Yeah, there are lots of areas in the country that are doing better than Vermont. There are others that are, you know, struggling like Vermont is too. But I think when, you know, if you had to cast a white blanket over it, the, the places that are doing better, um, they have the regulation and permitting is a lot easier, um, and they are willing to to do housing density, putting lots of homes on smaller pieces of property, and and I think they've they've I don't know if they were ever, you know, they've given up or they, you know, we have this I don't know kind of this mentality I think in Vermont where people think that every house has to be a one-off, like it has to be unique and look different, you know, <laughs> go through our downtowns, no no two homes look look the same way in our communities, and they've you know, they've given up on that. And, you know, so a crew can come in instead of putting up one house in a summer, they can put up five houses in a summer. And they all look the same pretty much, you know, maybe a little bit different color, you know, but 
um, they've they've given up on the one off model. We seem to be clinging on clinging to the one off model, which is a a terribly expensive model of building. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, um, I would like to invite our candidates to speak whatever they about what they'd like to. You can think of it as a closing. You can think about talk about vision, uh, a specific topic that you anything you'd like. And um, let's have Amanda go first, then Scott, then Sabrina, just for no particular reason, other than to mix it up. Other than to mix it up. Go ahead. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think a topic we didn't talk about tonight, which I hear a lot about, is substance misuse and public safety. Those are, you know, topics that often do come up at forums like this. You know, I'm sure if we had another bit of time, it would have come up here. I know in St. Johnsbury, but certainly around the district, we're seeing, you know, upticks in, in folks, you know, um, who are experiencing you know, substance misuse and, you know, there's, there's fentanyl uh, trafficking happening. People are overdosing. This is a, a big concern. Um, and so I would just, I would just say that it's a, it's an area that's very close to my heart. And I think is something that we, we need to do. We're doing a lot in our, in our state, I think for this particular issue, but I think there's, there's more to do in a particular area that I think we haven't been doing great in is having Kind of service enriched housing so people often they come there there is recovery available uh, there is recovery slots available for people but it's only two weeks medicaid currently in our state only covers two weeks which is really nothing um, when you're talking about recovering from one of these opioids in particular or any substance really and then folks are brought back into the community or they are you know sent back to the community and there's really nothing else there um, there's nothing there's not a housing option for them that's available so often people go back to precariously living with friends or on the street or what have you which again is not a setup for for you know staying substance um, free or you know or even getting medical assisted treatment and so um, I just I would wanted to add that in terms of kind of the talk about housing and that service enriched housing could really help solve a lot of our could really help th those folks but that then would trickle to again health care uh, criminal justice because a lot of times what we see and in St. John's Bear I'm part of a team that's looking at um, public safety in our in our area but with the eye towards how do we really look at solving some of these problems because it's like um, emergency services you know um, police at EMS, they're, they're coming out, they're using a lot of their resources, and, and it often it's the same folks. You know, it's about 20, 20 different people, or what, ha like the number could vary, but it's, it's the same folks that really just aren't getting that the help they need when they need it in the right way. Um, and so we're, we're spending a lot of money kind of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And so I think our, our, our areas need more of that so that they can um, really help people be positioned to be on their, um, on their feet and, and c continuing on their journey. Um, and so a, a lot, I guess in conclusion, I would just say, um, in addition to that topic that, you know, you have, this is a, this is a big decision, right? We have our, our local um, legislators here in front of us. And I just want to tell you that I think, um, and, I, and I don't know what you learned from me today in terms of my style, but, um, you know, what I can offer is, you know, experience in, um, seeing, you know, it, working on behalf of people who've experienced some hard challenges, right? That's where I've devoted my career and that's what I would continue to do. Um, and, you know, that I have passion for that, that that drives me. It's a real value for me. And so listening to what folks have to say and then integrating it into policy, into ways of working with folks, that's something that, that is the way that I operate. So I just want you to understand that. And I want you to also understand that I'm, my approach would be collaborative. Um, I've always prided myself, is that a past tense word? I don't know. Um, I've always been proud of the fact that I um, can bring people together and can be persuasive sometimes um, to you know, help move things along on behalf of an issue that, I, that is important. Um, and I would bring that that skill set to the legislature, you know, on our on our behalf. And so I just wanted to share a little bit about like my style and the and the passion and value that I would bring. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll be a little a little more macro, maybe a little more brief. But you know, I think that basically for the last number of decades, uh, Vermont has pursued a path of 
you know, increased regulation, increased taxation, increased government spending, beyond what the economy support so can support as a path towards economic growth and prosperity. And it, it hasn't worked very well. And a lot of the, the train wrecks that we are dealing with right now, housing, education funding, and others, they really, they are a byproduct of that philosophy. And I'm committed to, you know, I mean, I understand we do need to tax and we do need to regulate and we do need government services, but we need to focus more on innovation and efficiency as tools to really get this state going um, and solve some of these intractable problems. And that's what my work really in the legislature has been focused on, um, corporate tax reform, common level of appraisal reform, pension reform, really good, good bills that have passed um, uh, the Vermont Child Tax Credit that probably wouldn't have got through with, without my work. And I've had a great history of working in a bipartisan way. Um, you know, I've, I've made the right votes on all the key, all the key votes, I, I think. Um, I, I've thrown my voting record out there in a number of different places. Um, and, you know, nobody's um, saying, hey, that's the wrong vote. You made the wrong vote on that tax increase or that program or whatever. And so I, have a, I think I have a very strong voting record. I've got a history of accomplishment in that building. I know how to collaborate in that building. I know how to work in a bipartisan way. Um, I understand the individuals. I understand the process. And um, I've had a great 10 years, and I'm really looking forward to to taking that over to the Senate and uh, continuing to work on ideas that I'm passionate about um, and also um, branch out into some other ideas that, um, that need solving in Vermont. So thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. And it's my absolute pleasure to both thank Sabrina for being so patient and Sabrina Morrison, our state rep candidate for Walden, Hardwick, and Standard. Um, to replace Chip Triano, and I invite you to comment on anything you would like to let people get to know you, and then we're going to have some opportunity for some smaller group discussions if, if, you, if you would like. All right, go ahead. Hi, I'm Sabrina Morrison. I don't know if this is on. Is it on? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm new to politics. I'm on a, three school boards, and I grew up in Hardwick, and um, I'm raising my family here. I have a small business. Um, we also have a family farm. And I think it's really important to get out there and advocate for the uniqueness of our area. I think a lot of things that they are doing in Montpelier don't always um, highlight some of the things that we're experiencing here. And um, so, especially being on the school board, there's some things that I'm concerned about and I want to be there to advocate for our kids and our communities so awesome well um, we sort of talked about this a little bit beforehand um, there's some comfortable couches over there if you would like to talk some more with Sabrina she'll be camped out over there um, uh, sorry Amanda you can stay right here yeah I, I'm, <laughs> thank you for that help <laughs> Thank you for the help. And um, I would invite Scott just to be over there in the sort of table area over there. And um, we're, is there any, so we're, we've got, you know, we're close to 7.30, but um, we've got the space until 8.30. Or, and, but so just, just uh, we, the candidates said they'd be here till 8. So um, feel free. Please get some pie. Um, and thank you all for coming. All right.